Hello, everyone, and welcome to Trade Finder Live. My name is Zach. I'm one of the team here at Elliott Wave Options, and I'll be facilitating this session tonight with Rob Roy. I'll introduce Rob here in just a few moments, but as always, we need to cover off some important housekeeping details about the session. First and foremost, this is our live disclosure disclaimer agreement. If you've attended any of our live sessions previously, then you've seen this. The main thing to take away from it is that we are not licensed, licensed investment advisors in the United States, so nothing is to be taken as personal investment advice. We do have this available on our website if you'd like to read it in full detail there, or certainly feel free to take a screenshot of it if you like, but that's the main point to take away. All right, so for this session, as you'll see circled on the screen, there's only one method for asking questions, and that's going to be in the Q&A window. Uh, now, we're live streaming to multiple different platforms. Um, so keeping in mind, Rob will go through his general market analysis, uh, go through some case study considerations, and then with the time remaining, open it up to some questions. And um, as I said, we're live streaming to multiple different platforms, so we're going to uh, feed in questions um, from a, a combination of all those platforms. So if we don't get to your question, just know it has nothing to do with the validity of your question. We just only have so much time. With that, take it as encouragement to attend the insiders meeting when there's a 45 minute portion solely based on answering question, questions for our paid subscribers. So obviously a much higher likelihood of getting your question addressed there. Um, any support related queries I can handle in the chat window. So definitely feel encouraged to write anything like that um, throughout the presentation in that window. Also for any interaction amongst other attendees on the webinar. Uh, please make a note that at the bottom it defaults to uh, host and panelists. So if you'd like everyone on the webinar to be able to see your message, be sure to change that too to everyone uh, and then that way it'll be visible. All right. So uh, yeah, over the weekend, uh, Rob had mentioned in his uh, at the close uh, shorts that uh, I've been getting a lot of positive feedback that he's been kind of uh, been given a hard time about being too bullish. And uh, as we saw on that upside today, uh, maybe he was right. So I'll be uh, anxious to hear his thoughts. Um, on that as uh, as always, and looking forward to interacting with you all. So thank you for joining us for this live session. I'll introduce who we're all here for, the man of the hour, that's Rob Roy. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's Trade Finder Live. If this is your first time viewing us, welcome to you and welcome to everybody on the multiple live streaming services that are out there. This is getting well beyond my level of social media with all the different services out there. But uh, welcome to everyone that's viewing us regardless of where you may be. And uh, as Zach mentioned, we uh, uh, will go through and talk about the market. We'll do any kind of a review of LA Wave Options trade alerts. I'll give you an idea of how that works. Uh, interesting one that I wanted to share with you on a butterfly, something that I don't normally do is a sideways butterfly uh, outside of our uh, AI-based time strategy. Uh, we'll look at uh, any case study considerations. Uh, we've only got one uh, that's live now, and that was the one we looked at last week. And uh, we'll see if we can find another one this evening and then open it up to the live Q&A. Perhaps uh, we have a little more time for Q&A tonight because there's not a whole lot of other stuff to talk about with uh, what's been going on in the market. So let's go ahead and get right to it. Uh, as Zach mentioned, uh, over the weekend in our weekend update, people were giving me a hard time. Rob, you're too bullish. Why are you so bullish? And I'm not bullish. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be bullish. But I look at the chart and see that at some point in time, after this wave three to the downside, we are going to have a wave four bounce. If we have a wave four bounce to the upside, that means we have lower lows still coming with a wave five low to come. So I really don't think that's being bullish. It was just talking about the fact that at some point we will bounce up to the wave four. Now on today's move, we moved above the 10-day moving average, really solid volume right on the average volume. And just by the way, when I'm looking at the volume, I'm looking at the 200 day moving average. That's the red line. So if you're wondering, well, what do you consider average, above average, or below average? The red line is the 200 day moving average for volume. And we were dead on it uh, today. So that's decent volume, especially on an up day. Often we have more volume on down days than up days. So I think you have to respect that. And the comment that I made in last night's uh, short. And if you haven't uh, been looking at our shorts, if you're on um, TikTok or 
LinkedIn. Uh, please follow us there. And we don't need too many more subscribers on LinkedIn to be able to live stream there as well. So love to have you uh, uh, click on that um, and, and follow us along there, if you will. Uh, but uh, when I did the uh, at the close yesterday, it's talking about the fact that until we break above or excuse me, until we break below this 360 level right here, you have to respect the possibility of bouncing up into a wave four. Now, just because we bounced up today still doesn't mean that we're going to go up and hit that wave four target. Futures are up after hours. I did the uh, at the close a, a little while ago and was talking about Netflix. Netflix really substantially beat their earnings forecast, and they haven't even started going through and trying to uh, rectify all the people that are sharing login details, which I, I think is probably substantial. And they were saying that they might not even get to that till next year. Um, okay. Um, that seems like a lot of paid subscribers that they could be getting um, if they did, because I, I, I don't know anybody that doesn't share their Netflix uh, login information with somebody else. So I do think that's a significant problem. And uh, if they were to uh, crack down on that, it would really be a big uh, jump in revenue. But hey, they uh, substantially beat uh, the, the new subscriber growth for this quarter. Stock's up after hours. United Airlines is up after hours. So um, if we continue to the upside on the futures, now remember, just coming up to hit this wave four really is nothing more than bouncing back to the 50-day moving average. And so still in an overall downtrend and with a wave four corrective bounce to the upside, as I said earlier, still means a wave five to the downside which is lower low. So I didn't really feel like I was being bullish and I just felt like I was looking at the charts and we'll see if the futures being to the upside can hold into the open tomorrow. There's a long time between now and when the market opens tomorrow. But you have to respect that. And the key level is 360. Now the key level becomes 380. Can we bounce above 380? Can we get above that level? maybe label that way for hit that 50 day moving average. Then you start to think, okay, when will the reversal come for the wave five to the downside? But for now we're looking to see, does this bounce to the upside continue? If we look at the 10 year, interest rates are staying solid. You can see that we've had a little bit of up and down, but not a whole lot, but interest rates are hanging in there uh, pretty strongly, uh, right around 4% or above. Uh, on the uh, on the 10 year. So um, we can see uh, a continued move to the upside. If we get up to four and a half percent, is that going to be too much? I don't know if that's too much for the market or not. I always think that it depends on how we get there. If we just slowly creep up there, I think the market handles that pretty well. It's the big jumps in rates that the market doesn't like. So when we have those big up days in rates, that's when the market kind of gets a little shaken up and says, ah, you know, this is uh, this is not good uh, for international companies, et cetera. And speaking of that, let's take a look at the dollar. Now, the dollar is starting to consolidate a little bit from this big wave three run. There's a little bit for everyone here. If you're bullish on the dollar, you're thinking, OK, we're consolidating nicely here without giving a whole lot back, especially on this fairly vertical run to the upside here. If you're bearish, you're going to say, OK. That's it. We had this vertical peak. We're backing off and maybe we're getting to the point where we can start thinking about a way for it. We're getting to the point in the dollar to where I'm not sure if having a dollar move to the ups or excuse me, having a dollar move to the downside is good or bad. Um, you know, there's been a lot of money that's rushed into it from foreign countries. And if we start to move to the downside, the positive argument is. All right, people are feeling like things are better globally and they don't need to hide in the dollar and they can take their money and use it elsewhere where they feel they can get a better return. That would be a positive. But the other side of the coin is if we start to move down in the dollar and people aren't taking their money out and we start to move lower, does that mean significant weakness in the U.S. economy to the point where it's affecting the dollar. And is there enough weakness? This is really where the point is. Is there enough weakness in the US economy to offset the buying that's coming in to the dollar? To me, that's the negative or bearish 
argument. So I think we're in a little bit of dichotomy here uh, on the dollar, uh, but we're starting to form a little bit of a symmetrical triangle. It's not quite there yet, but it's underway. And if we see this continue uh, towards the point here, then obviously we're gonna expect some sort of a significant break in the dollar. It's, <laughs> it's part way there as far as the formation of that symmetrical triangle. So I think we have to respect the fact that regardless of whether we continue in towards the point of the triangle, that we formed enough of a triangle to expect some sort of a move in the dollar. What do you think it's gonna be? Do you think it's gonna to be to the upside or the downside? And what do you feel about that? Where's your viewpoint on the movement uh, of the dollar? If the dollar were to break to the downside, is that a positive or a negative? I really kind of feel if the dollar breaks to the upside, it's hard to make a bullish case out of that. But I just gave you two different arguments on if the dollar were to go lower, um, how one consider it, could consider it bullish and another could consider it bearish. If we take a look at the VIX, still hanging around that 30 to 35 range. So if I shrink this down a little bit, so we can see the blocks between 30 and 35, even with all that selling that we've had, still not even a move above 35, nothing. And then a little bit of a move down today with the rally, perhaps that continues tomorrow if the futures hold into the open tomorrow and we have another update tomorrow, maybe we break below 30. Uh, but just amazing to me that with the amount of selling that we've had and some of the ugly days that we've had, nothing has gotten us above 35. And I still keep that kind of in the back of my mind that there's the possibility that we have a really ugly day and we spike in the VIX and maybe that's the flesh out and that's the end of it. Maybe we have to create that wave four first before that occurs. I could see that, I could understand that um, and I could be totally wrong on this, perhaps just the constant pounding. Remember that uh, analogy that I did way back on the boxer versus the puncher uh, as far as um, just constantly peppering that 35 level is going to act the same as if we had a spike up to 40 or 50. So we'll see how that plays out uh, over the next several weeks. And if we continue up into this uh, wave four bounce. All right. So let's take a look at some other markets in the weekend update. I, I didn't do the diamonds or the IWM or the Qs just because wanted to look at some other different markets. So let's go ahead and cover those now. You can see a pretty nice bounce uh, in the Dow, at least on the diamonds, uh, over the last few trading days. And 46% already, the wave four has been labeled there, has not been labeled on the SPY, but it's telling us that we are in a wave four. So uh, are the diamonds ahead of the SPY? You could certainly argue that, especially with a 46% bounce but now we get to the point where the rubber hits the road on the dia because 310 is that important level now we made it through 300 with very little problem but there's a little more support resistance at 310 so we'll see if that's where we go uh, does that turn things back do we continue higher from there um pretty nice looking chart on the five wave impulse pattern and remember that just because we've bounced 46 percent we can still go up to 61.8 and have a really well-formed five-wave impulse pattern to the downside. Let's look at the Qs. And if we take a look at the Qs, um, there's a pretty decent bounce uh, there, um, <laughs> at least at the open, and then move back down. So when we, we compare that with what we just looked at on the uh, diamonds, um, you can see it's not even close so it begs the question, and we talked about this a while back as well, have the diamonds become that value place? It used to be years and years ago that the Dow was it. It was, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was the top 30 industrial companies. That was the sign of growth uh, in the economy um, uh, in the United States. And then we kind of got away from that and they became like just big dinosaur companies that uh, have so many shares outstanding that it hardly moves. Uh, and everybody moved towards the S&P, the blue chips, uh, the 500 
uh, blue chip companies. And that was a better representation of the market as a whole. Uh, but now you can see that with that bounce in the diamonds, is the Dow starting to lead again? Because if it was just purely value, uh, you wouldn't necessarily think that it would have quite the, quite the bounce that it's had. And so then when we see the Qs and you look at the 10-day moving average, yeah, we got above the 10-day moving average, but look what happened. We opened higher and we closed down near the low of the day. So you, you can't really call this a banner day for the queues. Now, maybe that changes tomorrow or the next day or the next day as we start to get into earnings season and we start to bounce a little more significantly. But I think of the charts we've looked at so far between the SPY, the Dow, uh, and the queues, the queues are by far uh, the worst looking chart. So let's take a look at the IWM, uh, the Russell 2000, and see what that looks like. Well, the key, as you know, you've heard me talk about this so many times, is we are back above 170. 170 being the key level. So now the question becomes, can we bounce all the way to 190, the upper end of the range? Likely not, I don't think, unless something other than this wave four is being created. But notice on the IWM, the high hit the 50-day moving average, the high today hitting the 50-day moving average. That's pretty significant um, if you're one of the believers that small caps um, are a good uh, indication of economic growth, leading the rest of the markets, et cetera. So the fact that we're, uh, well, we didn't hold it. So that's, that's not the, the positive part, but we did get there uh, at least, even though it was turned back at the 50 day moving average, still didn't label the wave four. Uh, but I think of the charts that we've looked at, other than perhaps the, the, the diamonds, the DIA with the wave four label, the IWM is a pretty decent looking chart. All right, so to even bother looking at Bitcoin, I don't know why, but people are still really inter interested in it. And I've lost interest in it, to be honest with you, because this is just unbelievable, the way we continue to trade between 18 and 20,000. So until we break above 20, meaningfully or below 18, I'm just going to show it to you because a lot of people are interested in it. But to me, it's just immaterial anymore. Perhaps we get into next year when we have that howling and everything else. I mean, all that stuff that we talked about months and months and months ago seems to have been pretty accurate because um, nothing has really happened uh, since then. So um, you have to put some faith in that. All right, looking at the EWA, uh, 20 is the key, and we are above it for now. Can we get up to the 50-day moving average, that wave five at that 61.8% level uh, held? We took a look at it here uh, on the 14th and, and turned back above uh, the 20 level. So the question becomes now, can we bounce and get above 21? See, that's the problem. We, we're holding here at 20, but then there's more resistance at 21. So if we can get above there, then maybe we have something going here on the EWA uh, in Australia, but we've got to get above 21. And holding 20 is great uh, because you don't want to see that wave five taken out. Remember, that's the 61.8% level. The next level is 100% extension, which could happen uh, on the wave five. But for now, uh, holding 20, uh, we get a bounce up to 21, then we'll be wondering, can we get above 21? And if we do, as I said, you might have something to the upside, but nothing really matters now until we get above 21 or if we start to fall below 20. Those are the key levels. So looking at the EWC for Canada, their level, we just talked about with EWA of 20 and 21, their level is 31. And so we got below it back here in the middle of October, came back above it. So getting above 31 was key. We haven't made it back to the 50-day moving average yet. There's a little bit of resistance, not a lot, but a little bit at 32 going back to that July low. But really the main area of resistance on the EWC is up at 33. So from here, we could easily bounce up to 33, get back to the 50-day moving average, I think if the U.S. continues to bounce and gets to the 50-day moving average, you could see the EWC get up there as well. So um, looking a little better there 
on the on the EWC, I think, than some of the other places that you might want to look. Let's look at India on the INDA. And so far, we held uh, at 40 level. We talked about right here over the weekend that if we were to drop a low there, then we're probably coming down to the lows around 39, possibly even lower. But we've bounced back up, and now we're back above that really important level of 41. So we went through it before. We came down and tested 40. We're back above 41. Still haven't made it to the 50-day moving average on the INDA either. But remember, this wave four is disqualified, so we take that off. And you're looking at corrective patterns here in the INDA, and you just wait to see, can we get above that 50-day moving average? There's not a lot of resistance other than it being the 50-day. There's a little bit here at 42, but nothing real significant. The next point of significant resistance would be all the way up at 43. So you can see in some of these international markets, there is some potential for continued upside um, and you know upside that's meaningful uh, if we continue this bounce, I think, in the US. Uh, let's look at Germany, EWG. Take a look at that. And I had opined, if you will, in the weekend update, could we possibly break back below that five and relabel it again? That would be really amazing. Uh, but here we are at that 61.8% FIB level again. It's acting as pretty good support here, right? Also in this 20 area. Look, though, look at the EWG's high. Hit the 50 day moving average. We haven't said that about many of the charts that it touched the 50-day moving average. Now, we've talked about this in the past, too. In Trade Finder, we do it Thursday night in our insiders meeting for our alert subscribers, et cetera, that uh, moving back to um, the 50-day moving average in the EWG makes sense because when you get a bounce, the markets, the market or markets that are more oversold tend to bounce more. And what market could be more oversold over the last year or two with everything we've been looking at than the EWG? So we get a little bit of a bounce here, and it's the first one to get back to the 50-day moving average. So I think that's significant. Now, can, can we go anywhere from here? That'll be even more impressive. Uh, next in line on the EWG is going to be getting above 22. Can we continue that bounce and get above the 22 level. We'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and, and show a few charts that I think people are going to ask about. Uh, they have been asked about on uh, YouTube uh, with our weekend update. Uh, some have been asking about gold. So let's go ahead and take a look at the GLD. Uh, maybe <coughs> I'm stealing some of your thunder for later, Zach. Apologize if, I, uh, if I'm doing that, but just Where's the bid? It looked like we had something going way back uh, in the beginning of October when we were bouncing to the upside. And we said if we could just get a follow through day, <coughs> pardon me, then we were likely going to go up to 168 to the previous four. Follow through day never came. And so here we are back down. And it looks far more likely that we're going to come test these wave five lows than anything else. What would it take to get a bit of a bounce? <laughs> Some unexpectedly good inflation news. And we certainly haven't had that lately. But if we could get that, that could be the catalyst to finally put that bid into GLD. Right now, I think you're just watching. If it breaks below this wave five low that occurred back on the 26th of September, then you could short. And if it could get above 160, you could go long. But we're kind of in no man's land right now and i just think gold is something you keep an eye on you watch and you see what happens some of you've been asking about ung so i thought i would go ahead and bring that one up now on this i would really like to go short ung but we gapped down yesterday and we didn't feel like gap today we went even lower that's frustrating because you know i don't like these gaps so we had all this sideways consolidation and then we gap down. And so we're still oversold from the 10 day moving average. We still haven't filled this gap. So it, it's really hard to go short at this point in time, even though I do feel and seasonality um, would say that we are starting to get past the seasonally bullish time for 
um, natural gas, UNG, and I know all the geopolitical things. We've talked about those here uh, a number of times a while back, uh, but I still think that uh, we're probably going to be working our way back down into this area around here, around 15. That's what normally happens. But for me personally, I can't go short when we're oversold and have gapped down. Those are just two no-nos for me. And I could be wrong. We could just run down to 15 before we fill that gap and before we retrace back to the 10-day moving average. But in my mind, the prudent thing is to wait and see if we do bounce um, back up and fill that gap and come back to the 10-day moving average on UNG. If we were to do that, then I would be very interested in going short natural gas uh, down towards that 15 level. But for me personally, I just simply can't do it uh, right now. Like I said, we could look back at that and say, well, that was the right move and you missed it and that's okay. If that's the way it plays out and I missed it, then all right. Uh, I'm sure some of you are going to want to know about oil as well. And I think a big key happened today. We talked about this in the weekend update as well. Yesterday, we saw it right at 70. And I even asked you guys to write your opinions in. Uh, we did that last week and this past weekend on because 70 is such a key level on USO. Do we bounce from here and go higher or do we break down? And we know what the bullish argument is, right? We know it's because OPEC is saying they're going to cut production. They want oil back up. They want to get the price of oil back up. But then I proposed the argument of, but what about the demand side? That's the supply side. And everything is supply demand, right? And so what about the demand side? What if we do move into, and now we have um, Solomon uh, at uh, Goldman Sachs saying, hey, watch out. We had JP Diamond, uh, JP Diamond from uh, Jamie Diamond, he tried to say, from JP Morgan, uh, talking about, hey, the recession could be significant. And now we got guys from Goldman Sachs saying this could be a significant recession as well. That's my argument on oil. What if we do move into a significant recession and we have a drop in demand? I don't know that the Saudis can cut enough production to where they can offset the drop in demand. And that's the bearish case for oil. So the bullish case is the cut of supply. The, bear, or the, bullish, or the bearish case is the drop in demand. So uh, uh, which one wins? It's a tough argument right now, in my opinion. So 70 is key. We had a breakdown today. Do we get a follow through? If we do get a follow through, then I think we're coming down to test these September lows here. And then we'll see from there. Does OPEC come out with more headlines to try to uh, put another bid under oil? It worked last time, at least for a little while. Uh, but now we've rolled over again. So their rhetoric about cutting supply, put a little bit of a bid in. And now we're starting to head back down. So I think tomorrow is a really important day for oil, at least for the USO, to see if we can put a follow through or confirmation day with that break of 70 today, which is key. Again, 70 being such a key level. So those are the, some of the markets I wanted to show you. Now, if we go back and look at our case study consideration for last week, it was on FCN. And we said that we thought uh, we would look bullish on FCN up until 190. So this is where it was a week ago. And you can see a pretty decent looking DMI. What a primary confirming indicator for LA Wave. And we've continued to move to the upside. So now we're up at 182 was the close. So 182.97 was the high. So we've moved from 178 up to, so four, four point move, not bad. Uh, on our uh, case study from last week. So pretty impressive there. And then what I wanted to show you was we did this for our alert subscribers at ewotrader.com. Uh, we have an alert service where we send out, and you know, uh, for Trade Finder, we come up with trade ideas and then you're on your own on, on how you want to manage them. We call them case study considerations. You consider it and you take it from there. For our alert subscribers, what we do is we will send out an alert for any entries, adjustments, and exits. So we're there to hold your hand from the beginning of a trade through the opening alert to the end of the trade with the exit alert. And so that's the difference between our alert service uh, versus TradeFinder. So for our alert subscribers, 
we did a sideways butterfly. And normally, as I said in the open, I reserve the sideways butterflies for our AI based time strategy. And I mean, it's been phenomenal the results. Uh, it's over a year old now and has not yet had a losing month. So, uh, you know, infusing AI into your technical analysis, uh, even on CNBC, they've been talking about that's the wave of the future. And we already have uh, a product uh, that uh, infuses AI into it. And some people have asked, does the AI continue to learn? Yeah, that's what AI means, right? It's always analyzing and continue to learn from it. So that means it's only gonna get better. And over a year of being live without a losing month so far, to think that it's only gonna get better is pretty darn exciting. Um, but however, this was not an, an AI strategy. This is one where we had an earnings report coming up. The stock had been going sideways. And so the expectation was, at least in my opinion, we would continue to go sideways as we approached earnings. And I do think there's gonna be a significant break on earnings, but the expectation to continue to go sideways there. And when you look at it, look at that. That's exactly what happened. The reason I'm showing you that is we exited that today and it made about $1.50 on the butterfly. Um, and there's still a few days to go to expiration, but the midpoint of the butterfly is 30. It's a 30, uh, 35, 25 butterfly. Again, 30 being the mid strike. And we're just hugging it so well, traded it right through it today. Um, it was time to go ahead, take the gain uh, in that butterfly, uh, and then wait for the directional breakout uh, on earnings, which um, I expect to have happen. If I had to guess, which is nothing more than a guess, I'd venture to say that's likely to break to the downside. It's a consumer stock, and you could make an argument based on the earnings that we've had so far that it's the next quarter that the earnings are going to be the more severe because we're just starting to get the ramifications of that first, maybe into the second rate hike. But most pundits are thinking that we're really only feeling the effects of the first 75 basis points. And how many more increases do we have to go? A lot. That's why people are calling for the recession is it takes a while. When the Federal Reserve raises rates, it's not an automatic effect uh, on the economy. It takes time for that to work its way through. And we've got several more that we're uh, gonna have to wait through. And, and that's why people think that maybe even in the next year, before we feel the full effects of the recessionary pressures from all these Federal Reserve rate hikes. Anyway, there's an argument to be made that maybe the consumer is still okay this quarter because we haven't really felt the full effects uh, of the recessionary pressures yet, but next quarter, watch out. I don't know. I, I just feel like there's, there's a lot of negativity out there. And I think that we can draw something on Netflix's earnings. Now the bank earnings and all that kind of stuff, that's, you know, if, if the banks can't make money with rates rising as fast as they are now, they're never going to make money. So, you know, having a good earnings season from the financials, I think, um, is normal and not surprising at all. But what about the consumer? What when we start finding these consumer stocks? And then you look at Netflix and you can say, well, that's a consumer stock. But when did Netflix have its big bounce? During COVID, right? When everybody was staying home and watching Netflix. Are we starting to see that again? Are people not because of COVID, but are people starting to, you know, move into the homestead and not venture out as much because of the fact that we're feeling inflationary pressures at the gas pump, at the grocery store, et cetera. And then if you were on the other side of that argument, you would look at United Airlines. Well, United Airlines had good earnings. Well, that means people are flying and traveling, right? So, you know, it's, it's a difficult time right now as far as which way things are going to go. But I think the answer is pretty easy in the future. As far as earnings next quarter are just going to be really brutal, I think. The question is, how bad are they going to be this quarter? So far, okay. But again, starting off with the bank earnings, I don't think that's a fair assessment of what the consumer may be doing. Um, just because um, it's, it should be an ideal environment for 
the banks and financials. So um, anyway, uh, this worked out extremely well, and we'll be looking for the indication from stocks like HZO uh, and consumer-based stocks uh, as we move through the earnings season as to whether or not the consumer is feeling it yet or is the consumer still, you know, I read the commentary on Netflix and they were saying, the consumer is still spending. People are buying Netflix subscriptions. <laughs> you know, I just view that the exact opposite way. I view that as people are staying at home. They're not spending. They're not doing things. And that's why more people are subscribing to Netflix and why there were more uh, added subscribers than expected. The fly in the ointment, though, is the United Airlines better than expected earning. Because that's, again, the other side of that argument of, well, if, if United Airlines is doing well, people are traveling. And then we could really break this down and get into all kinds of arguments, couldn't we? Uh, well, is it just because they cut capacity um, and that's why they're doing well and they haven't added capacity back? So every single plane that flies is full and you know they're not wasting any fuel, they're not wasting any empty seats. You, know, you could get into all kinds of arguments there. I think we'll have a better answer as we get through this earnings season as to where things are. All right, so really, I'm just babbling on. I don't really have much else to say, Zach. So uh, let's go ahead and open it up to some questions. All right, sounds great. Thanks for that presentation, Rob. And as always, I'm sure everyone's excited for some extra time on the Q&A. We will um, start out uh, with a question from Chris, who would like to look at Boil, B-O-I-L. All right, let's take a look at it. This is a natural gas ETF. We did look at UNG. Um, and this, wow, this is a, uh, a more interesting looking chart actually than UNG because this is the key um, right there at 40. This is going to tell you everything uh, on whether or not we can bounce from here. And, you know, I think this plays into what happens on, you know, this may be a precursor to what occurs with UNG. But if we were to break 40, then, you know, 20 is next on boil. And if we can hold this and bounce back to the upside, then that means my thesis on natural gas, wanting to be bearish on it, I can't do it right now because of that gap that we talked about before, just you know, disciplines won't allow me to do that, but um, I really would like to go bearish on uh, UNG. But if we hold 40 here on boil and bounce, then maybe you need to rethink that thesis and say that, hey, look at the other side of that. And, and maybe UNG goes back to the upside. So um, I, I don't know much else to say on this other than we are there. This is the where the rubber hits the road on the assemble. Uh, and just watch 40. If it can bounce from here, you got a chance of going back up to resistance at 60 there because that's the next resistance. There's really nothing in the way from 40 to 60 if you do get an upside bounce. If it breaks 40, there's not much in the way between 40 and going back down to 20. So that could be a really good trade either way. It's how it handles this 40 level. Last time we got there in the beginning of July, it bounced, but that was also the seasonally bullish time for natural gas. Now we're getting past that. Now we're getting into the area where natural gas starts to look at six months down the road. We're coming out of winter, out of uh, early spring, and the demand goes down. So I don't know. Be watching that uh, pretty clear, clearly for, or pretty closely, I should say, uh, for how that plays into my uh, UNG thesis. So thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate it. I'm going to actually make a little note of that to, uh, yeah, to keep an eye on that. The same thing. That's definitely an interesting one uh, to look at in comparison to that UNG chart that we were yep. just looking at. Um, we did have a comment just come through from John asking uh, if there's no trade candidate for tonight. So just if you wanted to briefly mention what you had said about that. Um, no, that's a really good question. Let's see if we can find one. I got to babbling on so long, I wanted to get to the questions, but let's see if we can find something. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to talk about tonight, as far as a case study consideration is, and it's not on the list, but there's been three uh, insurance stocks that have shown up. Travelers, so we'll take a look at these three, three charts. Uh, travelers, 
So I, I, I think that's telling you something. These are defensive sectors, right? Because people view, well, people got to buy their insurance. It's almost like the sin stocks, right? Tobacco, tobacco, alcohol, and gambling uh, that we talk about so often as being defensive sectors. Insurance is as well. Money moves to places where people still have to do it, right? They still have to have their insurance. So you look at that chart there on travelers and um, the five wave, LA wave pattern moving back up here to the previous four uh, would be the expectation there. Okay? And then the other one that has, uh, the other, the, one of the other ones that has shown up is Cigna. Um, that one has shown up on the searches recently uh, as well. And we'll put the LA wave pattern on there. You can see that's a pretty extended wave five. That's the thing that bothers me about that. We had 229%. You rarely see a wave five that high. How much further can this one go? And it's not a real exciting DMI. So it's not showing that there's a lot of strength there. So I tend to discount that one. But the one that I did really like, and this showed up a couple of times, and we sent out an alert to our alert subscribers on this. And you can see it had a really good day. Uh, we sent that out. Uh, yesterday was on Globe Life. And the problem, as far as having that as our case study consideration for tonight, is it gapped up. And I hate that. Um, I wish you would have just moved up, but now we're starting to go vertical. Now we've got a gap up and we're above the 10 day moving average. It looks great to go up to 120. And I do think we eventually get there, but what has to happen in between? Now it could continue to go vertically up and hit that target, or it could also come right back down to the 10 day moving average and fill that gap. Anything can happen with this now. So if we were a little bit more uh, from the conservative standpoint of let's wait and see, and that's kind of what we did. We didn't put on a full position. Normally with our alert service at ewtrader.com, we put out $500 of risk per alert that goes out. That's our guidelines, and that's the parameters, and we only did $300 or so uh, on this, and that left room in case it pulled back down so that we could add to it, so that we could, uh, uh, you know, maybe just step in, dip our toes in the water, and then add and create a full position if it were to back off. Well, not only did it not back off today, it gapped up, uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out over the next couple of training days. But look at the DMI. There's great separation between the two directional indicators. We're getting another tick up in the positive directional indicator. The ADX is only at 30. It's between the two. And there's, there's room to run there. So the DMI is telling you, hey, there's strength to this move. It might be getting a touch vertical for comfort. It's not so bad yet. Um, but, man, if, this, if it wasn't for this gap. So I, I do think it's still the best thing to look at. I mean, or we could, we could do Netflix, which, you know, is going to have a big open tomorrow, but that's not fair. So let's just do this. Let's go ahead and, and keep an eye. And all the insurance stocks, I think, are, are worth a, a look. But I think Globe Life here uh, up to 120 is the best looking one of anything that's out there. And just understand that it could pull back. We could see it come back and test even 110, uh, and it would still be okay. So what I'm saying is that because of this gap up and where the 10-day moving average is, if we were to test back down to 110, I would still say that there's no change to this chart at all. It's just a touch over bought right now. So, you know, that's the difficult thing. Stocks can stay overbought or oversold for periods of time. And I, I, this, this is my phrase. Stocks can stay overbought or oversold for a period of time, but not a long period of time. So where's that definition, right? I mean, that's the gray area. What, what defines long versus um, just staying overbought or oversold? So when you look at that, I, I still think we're going to 120. If it, if it does bounce back down after we enter, you can add to it. Maybe it even bounces back on the open tomorrow uh, and, and we get it in at a better price. But um, it's been on, it's rare that we have a stock that shows up on my impulse searches multiple days. Usually it's a, it's a one-time deal to have all the indicators, all the confirming indicators that we look at in conjunction with and supporting of Elliott Wave um, to show up more than once. And so this one has, and I just think it's the best, best looking chart uh, of anything out there. One last comment I'll make on this chart. And we'll get back to the questions, Zach, is the fact that it broke above 
this resistance at 105. So I don't think one a test of 110 means anything at all. 105 was the big resistance, and we we went through that. We consolidated on top of that, and now it looks like it's off for a run. And I think that matters a lot with what's going on uh, in the market and the economy as well. So, all right, back to questions. Very well. Thanks for that, Rob. So this next one here we have is uh, a, a very well thought out and uh, interesting question. It's on good old Tesla. Uh, we've had some chat in uh, the YouTube crowd as well about Tesla. Uh, this question here is um, from David on Zoom. Hey, Rob, last time you looked at Tesla, you mentioned it will likely test 240. Currently, it seems like it's in a corrective structure on a positive trend. Being how Netflix shot up after earnings, what are the odds Tesla does this? Also, I do have a question. Why is it stocks boom at 4 p.m. and not when earnings release like a half hour or hour later? This seems very fake or rigged in the sense of the report not being out yet. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. <laughs> oh, well, we, we could spend a lot of time <laughs> on conspiracy theories on that last question there. Um, you know, maybe we'll do a conspiracy show one time because, you know, we can get into the Federal Reserve and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I said that um, if Tesla broke 240, which was just to be clear on what my comments were, that was where that triangle breakout was. And if we broke 240, the test down to 240, so that's going back a ways, well, was likely to retrace back to the breakout of the triangle. So it did that. So then I said, well, if it breaks 240, then we're probably coming down to the lows. And that's exactly what happened. Tesla made it down to the lows. It bounced back um yesterday and today so on two decent days in the market it found a bid but look at today's bar uh closing near the low of the day not near the high of the day um so um i don't think you can consider that uh even though it, it technically finished up on the day just barely but i don't know that that's much of a bullish sign it would have been better if it had been a gap up right if it opened up and rallied so those of you that don't like gaps the way I do can say, well, it's better, you know, that it closed the gap throughout the trading day. And now we can hold here and continue higher. And maybe it does. But I don't know. Tesla is just feeling like if we make it up to that wave four, it's likely to roll back over. And I think that we're probably going to break that 200 level at some point. It may be a few months ahead before that happens. But I think the likelihood is down the road, um, Tesla breaks 200 and goes down to that wave five target. But in the meantime, we could easily go up. You can see the 50 day moving average is quite a ways up there around 260. So we could, in a decent market, if the S&P is gonna bounce up to the 50 day, Tesla could have a couple big up days and run back up here. But Tesla's just feeling a bit weak to me right now. So. Um, like yeah, it, a bounce as high as 260 is possible. I don't think you go any higher than that. And even if we get that high, I think what's inevitable is that we will come back down and break that 200 level at some point. But if we're going to get a decent market, let me finish the, with this. If we get a decent market where we bounce back to the 50-day moving average on the SPY, then Tesla could easily run up to 260. And that could be a good bullish trade, but just be careful. You know, it's not a long-term bullish trade, just an interim trade. All righty. That's it. Thanks, Rob. We're going to go over to Rin on YouTube, who would like to look at Rivian, R-I-V-N. Um, V-M, sorry. Uh, V-N. V-N. Getting there. Third time's a charm. <laughs> yep. Uh, key level here at 30. So this is really important with where we are right here. And what happens at this level is going to tell you a lot. Uh, hard to pick a direction. That wave four at 74% is still qualified, but man, it's awfully close to becoming disqualified. So can we hold that 74% wave four? It doesn't really matter that because 30 is so key. Can we hold 30 if so, and try to bounce back to the upside? Um, we may have a wave five underway, but if we break below 30, uh, it's easily at 25, maybe within a trading day or two that we go that far down because there's nothing to stop it between 30 and 25. 
And if we were to break 25, then we're coming down to try those lows from May at 20. But we got to break 30 first. And if we hold 30 and bounce, you could have something there. So 30 is the key on, on what it does here. Um, if, a if we have a decent market uh, in the wave four bounce, um, we could get a little bit of a bullish move here. But um, I don't know that we get all the way to that wave five target. I, I just don't think that happens. I'm more afraid that it's a short-term bounce here. And the inevitability is that we break 30 and go down to 25. That's nothing more than speculation on my part, though. So that's meaningless. I think it's always interesting to hear, though. I think many others would agree. Um, next up, we'll go to uh, Gerald on Zoom. Hi, Rob. Thank you for the great job you and your team do. And I'll just pause there and say there's been tons of positive feedback um, from our uh, other audiences on the other platforms as well, on the shorts and just in general. So thank you all for, for taking the time to share that. Uh, yeah, Gerald's no, we, question... we appreciate it for taking the time to post positive things. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Uh, Gerald's question is, are you surprised that Netflix is only up 35 points after earnings? I would have thought the stock would have jumped at at least 100. Thanks. Um, 100 maybe a little. We talked about it a bit earlier. just thought it would be a good one to bring back up. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand the question. And I think post split and all that kind of stuff, 100 would have been um, maybe a lot to ask for. But am I surprised it's not up higher than it is after hours? Yes. And I mean, they, that was, that was genuine organic growth, right? I mean, they literally added a lot more people than expected, like 150% more people uh, than, than, was, than was expected. And so, yeah, you would have thought that we would have some sort of a, a stronger bounce. Maybe it's just, you know, we get a bounce up and we crawl up to this wave five target. Uh, and then when you get to the wave five target, you start arguing, well, is there any chance we could come fill this gap uh, or is that a ways down the road? So I don't know. We'll have to see how that plays out. But I am a little surprised, yes, that it wasn't up more on surprising, I think, um, numbers considering, you know, the last two quarters they've been talking about going after all the login information sharing and they haven't done it yet. And so, you know, there's more future, a lot more future revenue if they really do crack down on that. Maybe they're job owning it and trying to scare people and to stop doing it because uh, I'm a little surprised that they haven't started yet. I was kind of surprised to see that uh, in the press release that they haven't done it yet because uh, they told us that they would. So I, I, there's a pretty good bullish thesis for Netflix, at least from the 220 level above, if, if it something happened and it broke below 220, we'd have to revisit that. But yeah, I'm surprised it's not up higher, but I don't think that's a bad place to be right now either with what I just talked about as far as future revenue. Yeah, I just thought that was an interesting one to, to bring up and just wanted to hear you expand a bit on uh, what you had briefly mentioned earlier. So yeah, that was uh, that was interesting to hear. And, um, yeah, absolutely. And intriguing to watch. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Silver from um, YouTube. We'd like to look at wheat. And we actually just had a, a request for wheat as well from uh, Doric on, on Zoom. So Wow, interesting. We haven't looked at wheat in quite some time um, way back here uh, in early 2022 when it was going insane. Um, it's calmed down quite a bit. And, um, you know, then you start to get into that demand thing. In with the recession, etc., and it's in a five-way impulse pattern to the downside. It looks to me like it wants to come back down and test eight again. And, and the possibility of breaking eight and going lower, I think, is there. So I, I don't see the bullish pace right now for we. Um, for those that are asking, I don't know if you're looking for validation that it goes lower. If you are, I think that's what happens. I think we test eight again, um, and, and then we see what happens from there. But it's hard for me to envision right now where the bullish thesis is. So I think when you have technicals, and we're technical traders at LA Wave Options, right? I mean, we are primarily technical, but we don't ignore fundamentals. 
Um, I know some technical people just poo-poo and pay no attention to fundamentals. We like to look at technicals with fundamentals as support. And so I don't see the fundamental case uh, for it going higher. So I think that supports the thesis of, of wheat going lower. So we take a look at it when it gets back down to eight and see if, if it looks like maybe there's more weakness ahead or if it could hold there again. Interesting though, I had, that's, we hadn't looked at that one in a while, so. Yeah, and there's uh, that one up. multiple requests for it. So yeah, our, as always, our subscribers are on it. Um, so I can't help myself, but there's a question here on expanding on why the rally was at 4 p.m. on, on Tesla specifically. And uh, uh, there was a comment earlier saying, um, would love a, a conspiracy show. And I, I mentioned that I would too. So uh, I know we don't want to go too deep into all that, but I guess just a quick overview on your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, there's, there's so many things that we could talk about. Um, options pricing over the last year or two from one, I think the world changed in, in, in how options are priced and what market makers can get away with from COVID and all the options buying that came in from buying calls and puts, uh, you know, we, 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 yeah, we, we could have a fun show and then, you know, getting into really deep stuff like the federal reserve, et cetera. We could, we could have a fun time. We, we may do that. We may just have a, a good old conspiracy hour and um, talk to a lot of people or talk about a lot of things. I think uh, interested be... that people are uh, interested in that. So yeah, that's good to know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think there would be a uh, quite a large crowd for that one. Um, we do have a hand up from DT on Zoom, but um, DT, we don't do voice questions for this session just because of the limited time. So please feel encouraged to raise that hand for uh, insiders on Thursday, and we'll be sure to uh, address your voice question there. Um, next up, we're going to go to Apple. There is a few requests for that one as well. Not a shocker there. Apple's had a nice bounce. Um, I made the comment that I thought we could possibly see those 130 lows. We got awfully close. I don't, you know, I don't think the market has bottomed yet, so I don't necessarily think Apple has, but it's at least had a pretty decent bounce. But look what happened today. It was up so nicely earlier in the day and only finished up at $1.34. So all we did was hit the 30-day moving average. Maybe we continue higher from here, uh, but it feels like a weak bounce uh, on Apple. And I would be surprised if the bounce carries us above 150. Maybe it does, but look how that coincides with the 50-day moving average. But um, I wouldn't change my thesis unless Apple could get back above 150 with follow-through. Uh, otherwise, I feel like this is just a bounce. And at some point we're gonna roll over and we could easily see 130 again, especially when the market starts to wave five lower. So uh, how much further to the upside can Apple go? 150 at least, and then, and then we'll see from there. So yeah, can understand why people are interested in that. One more. All right, uh, one more, we'll uh, wrap up here um, with PLTR. Wow, I haven't looked at that one in a while either. Um, that's what makes these so fun. You guys are bringing up stuff that we used to look at a lot and haven't looked at in a while. Um, but Palantir's just gone dead sideways here. And the key is that 10 level. You see what happened when it broke below 10, the volume spike, because that's when institutions that are only growth-minded have to get out. So they just bailed in one fell swoop. And now the only institutions that can own it have aggressive listed as their investment objective. And uh, they're good till five. So they've got a range to go. And so the stock is just continuing to go sideways. So we finished the wave five, bounced back up a little bit. Uh, and then we've just been going sideways. So when I see that, I would wanna see the AX to see, you know, can it go, it, we're getting down towards 13 which is kind of low when the VIX is at 30. So I would think that um, some of this consolidation is about done. We had Doji today. So likely a breakout 
coming at some point in time. The key question is just going to be which direction. If it bounces to the upside, you know, where the level is going to be, it's going to be 10 because that was the key where the big volume was on the way down. And if it breaks to the downside, then it means it's testing this level here. So I do think that um, Palantir has a breakout coming. I don't know which direction it's going to be. The charts are neutral, so it could be completely either direction. It's not a well-formed triangle, but it's acting exactly as if it was a well-formed triangle. But the key levels are 10 if it were to break higher, and then six and a half if it were to break lower. Thanks, everybody, for attending. As always, we really appreciate it. Time's the most valuable asset we all have, and we very much appreciate when you devote some of your valuable time to us, and we do our best to make this an informative and educational use of that time. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again next week.